Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from the creativepen.com and today I'm here with Mel Sherrett. Hi Mel. Hi Joanna. <laughs> so just as an introduction, Mel is the author of Taunting the Dead, named as one of Amazon UK's top selling ebooks of 2012. She's also written the Estate series of crime thrillers and has Watching Over You coming in January 2014. So Mel, it's so good to have you on the show. So good to finally do it, Joanna. <laughs> So when we met originally, you talked about, you know, sort of pursuing the dream of the book deal and it's taken you a long, long time. I wondered if you would just outline a bit of your journey from, you know, where you were and why you went indie and then where you are, where you are now. Yeah, I, I kind of started quite a few years ago. I originally started writing in 1999, taking it very seriously, sort of every night, every weekend, um, and then trying to get an agent from that. Um, I had uh, an agent for a couple of years, and then I moved on to another one. And throughout this time, I was writing um, checklists started off with, really, um, totally different than what I did but then I started to be a housing officer for the local housing authority and along with that and watching the program Shameless I just thought there's there's something here that nobody else, else has done yet nobody had actually written about housing officer and I could tell people about the eviction procedures and how, how homeless people are and things like that and, and play on the emotional side as well and so I decided to write a book called originally um, my first book in the series the, the estate was actually called the estate so um, I wrote that and managed to get myself an, another agent with that that book and uh, we just couldn't get it published. Publishers were, it was in between women's fiction and crime thriller, there was no particular niche for it so we, we struggled to find someone so in the meantime I'd written a couple more more in the background trying to wait, wait for the, the deal to come through um, and then we decided that because we couldn't do that, we would try with um, a police procedural, a police procedural element in the, with the dark gritty writing. And we, <laughs> I wrote Taunting the Dead, and then it was sent out to publishers who then said it was too much like Martina Coleman's other plant. So I'd gone from one extreme to the other of somebody saying that you know you don't fit into any niche, we can't market you, into the fact that you know all our books are full with people like Martina Cole, so we can't go any further. And then um, in July 2011, the Kindle came on the market. I started to study that and thought, you know what, I'm going to have a go at this. And with the backing of my agent, actually, at the time, I decided to take uh, Torn to the Dead out on, onto the Kindle, put, put it out there. I didn't do any marketing. I just literally put a blog post out and just said, here it is, see if you like it. And, and um, luckily it worked. <laughs> So then, because I've got that seat, that because I've done Taunting the Dead, I've then got a few books before, from before that I could now put out. Um, and I did myself a little marketing strategy and put one out every two months and um, got some really good snazzy covers designed. And they just went really well as well. So that was um, my self publishing journey. So, yeah. And then just bring us up to date with, uh, with what's happened more recently. Wow, this this year has just been absolutely amazing for me. Finally, in um, I had another agent, which is my third agent, which I'll talk about later on. But um, we took the book out. Um, we actually took out Watching Over You, which is is, is coming out next month, um, to London Book Fair, um, and I got an idea for a second psychological thriller because really I want to write psychological thrillers. I like writing about the emotion and the fear, and I like the trepidation there rather than the police procedural element. Um, so uh, she took Watching Over out, out for you, and it went out to quite a few editors and before uh, anybody could say anything, Amazon Publishing came along, Thomas and Mercer, and they um, they were just so responsive, but also they were saying what they could do with Taunting the Dead. Now, to me, Taunting the Dead was probably a book that was, was literally dead in the water because it had been out for two years. Mm. You know, I'd done tremendously well with it. It had never been in paperback, though, but um, I didn't think traditional publishers would be interested in it. 
So it was the deal that sealed it for me. Um, they made me a preemptive offer and then we just took everybody else off the table and went with them and it's been incredible. It's been a real good experience. Oh, brilliant. And I know you can't talk about that contract, so I won't even ask no. you. But, but it's, um, so, I mean, from your dream, like 12 years ago, 14 years ago, whatever it was you, you mentioned, when you started on this, um, none of the world right now was happening. I mean, as in Amazon, no. it wasn't a publishing company. So do you feel like this is, you know, the culmination of that dream for the last 14 years? Or do you think your dream has actually changed? I think my dream has, has actually changed. Oh, like I say it's definitely changed with the times. Um, I'm not quite sure if I had got a traditional deal a couple of years ago with Taunting the Dead, whether I would be sitting here now. Mm. And I also feel that a lot of people, when I took out um, Taunting the Dead, and then I still wanted a traditional deal. I never made it a secret. I always wanted the mm. traditional deal. Um, people would sometimes say to me, you can't have your cake and eat it. How? You just you can't do both, and actually no, I can, and it's it's really liberating to feel like people are asking me, oh, you're a hybrid author, yeah, it's great, I can now self publish my own books at the side of the traditionally published deals, no problem whatsoever. Who would have heard of that two years ago? It just was never anywhere that we would think that we would be able to go that far with it, and and now, um, I I can still be my own boss I can publish my own books when I want to but also I've got the backing of a team and a fantastic agent now and an editor which has been wonderful for me to work with an editor so I do feel like I have had my cake and eat it and I do feel there's a lot of icing on the top of the cherry as well <laughs> Well, no, and I love that. And I actually think that I see this year, in this year, 2013, we have seen the dream become, I want to be a hybrid author. You know, that seems to be what people want now. You know, I want to be Hugh Howie. You know, that yeah. ra rather We all than... want to be Hugh Howie. <laughs> yeah. We all want to be Hugh. Yeah. But, but, but we all want does... to meet you. <laughs> yeah, that does seem to be now, well, certainly for me and people who are in the industry, you know, who are savvy authors with, with a few books that does seem to be the thing doesn't it have you do, do you hear of anyone who just wants traditional anymore uh yeah i do think there's a few a few out there i'm not quite sure how there'll be another two years because if you remember two years ago when we first started um there was um I remember going to Harrogate Crown Festival two years ago and there'd been a massive big talk on ebooks and saying, Why are they all a half the price of a cup of tea and they're all at 99 pence and they, you know, they're destroying, uh, I think it was when they were 20 pence at the time, they were destroying everything. Um, and I sat there in the audience and I came away so disheartened and thinking, Everybody thinks I can't sell books, I'm selling them at 99 pence because of this. And now look at the market. Every publisher and every Every author out there is realising the value of cheap and cheerful products to get your other products up and running. So it's been a completely whole new ball game, and there's a lot of competition out there now, definitely. But for, for me sitting there now two years you know, two years ago, and now to think what it's going to be like in another two years, a lot of these authors now who are traditionally published will be hybrid. I'm convinced about it. You can do a lot more and a lot quicker and work at your own pace as well. And I I just feel like at, at the moment, this past year has just completely turned me into a businesswoman. I would never have thought that I would plan everything, project planning, project management, go to see accountants and all sorts of things that have been happening in the background. I never would have thought that would happen. So for me, I have got a business now. It is amazing. It's incredible. Yeah, it's funny you mention that because I've just written down products, my <laughs> own boss and competition, all of which are words that are more entrepreneurial than, are, than yeah. the, the author that you were back, you know, a few years ago, where it was all about, you know, just the writing. So now, you know, I've kind of changed the focus of, of my site now into really, because I think this is where we're going now. We're going into author entrepreneur as reality. So tell us a bit more about your behind the scenes and we'll come back to your writing process, but I'm actually interested on the business processes. So you have an agent, you have an editor, but what are the other things that you do to run your business now? 
Well, um, for the past few weeks, I've been getting all my books on to uh, create space in print. I've finally got all my estate series out. They were just being published at the moment, so that's been a real big thing for me to do. Um, I'm having my own station reprinted. I'm having, I've actually set up my own business now to, mm -hmm. to run, run the company through. It's called Blood, Blood Red Books. So, um, which I think depicts my, my, you know, me perfectly. Um, I would never have thought that I would be doing anything like I'm doing now. I'm, I've been contacted by newspapers all the time. I have my own column in my local newspaper. Um, I've just been fundraising this week. Um, I've opened a book fair, for goodness sake. It's absolutely fantastic in the city. Everybody's just, just so welcoming. But, but you, know, you, you talk about, yeah, entrepreneurial... I've said yes to so many things this year, Joanna, that I never would have dared to say before. And I do, you know, hand on heart think that if I had got that traditional book deal two years ago, I wouldn't have done much of this. I would have probably published the books. I would have sat back and perhaps not thinking about it. I certainly would have kept continue to blog because I do love to blog and I do think that's my, my, my free form of marketing um, but I um, do a lot in the background for other writers I'm mentoring two or three writers at the moment and these are the things that people don't see that we, we do literally we do literally work from the minute we get we get up and, until, until we go to bed and constantly working the writing probably two or three hours a day the rest of it is is, is you know interacting with people talking to my agent talking to my publisher cover design all sorts of things like that, um, and, and project management. I, I now sit down once a month and, and, and manage what I need to do for the rest of the month to make sure that everything gets out on time. I just don't think a couple of years back I would never dream of anything like that. No, no it's great, and it's great we're talking about this because I think this is the reality of the modern writer's life. Um, so yeah. when you say you're project managing things, how are you doing that? What are the tools that you're using? Is it just spreadsheets or calendar, or how are you managing your time like you know, on a day-to-day -day basis and going forwards? Yeah, I have a calendar. I have a reminder of a list, a to-do list to do every day. Um, and... I, um, if I'm drafting, I, I do uh, a couple of hours writing every morning um, and then I can get, get on. Sometimes it can take, I mean, you probably know yourself, two or three hours maybe just to catch up on emails. Mm -hmm. It is, uh, the emails that come up, come in are, are phenomenal, you know, business-wise. business, business wise. And, and then I'll, all of a sudden I'll have one in, and, you know, just pinging and say, would you like to do this? And would you like to do this? And you think, oh my gosh, and you go off and you have to calm yourself back down again. I think, yes, you need to work first. Um, so, yeah, it, it's been a, a real learning curve, I think, and I think next year I'm probably going to be doing the opposite to you. I'm going to be sitting back and doing more writing next year mm. because this year has been completely taken over by me marketing, my get, getting my deal and everybody asking me about it, you know, and, and making sure that for the past three months before the books came out, I've worked with um, some fantastic editors and had, you know, you talk about traditional deals where they don't have any input. I, I have the total opportunity opposite I have literally had for watching overview I have literally had maybe 20 30 covers designed until we got to the final one because we couldn't we wanted something that would wow people and we just couldn't get what we wanted I had eight different covers for taunting the dead and I've worked with copy editors so for three months of this year literally I just had to um project manage the whole thing to make sure that I got the edits done in time for them mm. uh, as well as everything else coming in sometimes you just have to think okay Everything else needs to wait for a moment, mm. um, and then you get, you get, you know, you get yourself back up on on track and, and start again. So yeah, to do lists every day. Um, every Friday afternoon, I sit down and I figure out what I need to do for the for the rest of the week for the following week, and planning the um, you know, like for instance, with me doing the create space paperbacks, I've had to plan in that the cop that the. the um, the inside is ready and the covers are being done while I'm doing in, in, inside, you know, things like that. So as it's all done on a certain date, I wanted it all done by Christmas. Didn't think I was going to get it all done by Christmas. I was deciding I needed to get two books out. I was deciding to get one out before Christmas and then one out at the end of January. And I have actually managed to do the two. I'm really quite astounded that I have. But I think sometimes in your mind, you work towards goals and you get there. Mm. And you don't know how you do it, and it might be the last minute. And I, I really panic sometimes, but they do, they do, they do work out on mm. time. No, that's great. And I, I mean, I'm just, I'm at the moment planning, you know, 2014. And you talk there about the 
writing being the most important thing, which it is, you know, for all of us. And um, so I'm really planning my production schedule and I love calling it a production schedule. <laughs> Because that's like, yes, I have to. And you talk about deadlines there. You have to have certain things. So what does your production schedule look like for next year? You know, how many <sighs> books are you are you planning to, to get out there? Uh, yeah, you, you talk. we do talk so far in advance as well, don't we? And I do like the way you say production because it is a business and people forget that it's a business. They just think that, you know, writing's always looked at as we can't make money out of it, Joanna. And I feel that, you know, we should be em embracing the fact that we are. We are two women here sitting here making yeah. money out of something that we, we love doing. And, and that's absolutely fantastic. So if I can give them, if anybody else the motivation to do it, then that's, that's absolutely wonderful. Um, schedule for next year, I am just finishing, <laughs> um, struggling to finish, as I say. Um, I'm doing the follow-up to Taunting the Dead, which is going to be called Follow the Leader. That's the first time I've ever said the title out oh, loud, okay. so, so yeah. Um, I'm writing that one now, hoping to get that one out next year, and I have another psychological thriller as well um, that's going to be written next year, and I think, I can't make my mind up at the moment whether to go for a full-length novel for um, the Estate Series Book 4, which I have had planned out for quite some time now, or do like yourself and do some novellas can't quite figure out which way is the way to go yet but it does depend on uh, how well watching you know, view does I suppose so mm. so that's two or three there <laughs> and you know and I know people always want to know and you, you talked a bit about planning so what is the writing process for the for the books um oh. sometimes people say to me um I can't believe how, how quick you write but I, I, I do write a lot very very quickly and um, when I'm doing my first drafts it's it's probably six to eight weeks three to four thousand words a day but I do allow myself to, to write a load of, of twallops sometimes do, do you want to get the words out right I, I like editing so my first draft is literally six weeks um, um, and then probably aim for 15 to 20,000 words a week. I do plan for about a month before, so I'd have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and I know what my characters are doing. I've probably lived with the characters like every other author has for quite a few months beforehand. And, um, and then once I've got that first draft down, I probably do exactly the same on the second draft. Um, and then the third draft is the one where I start putting in all, just, all the description, which is really, really daft, as, you know, probably to some writers but I can't write description I'm not very good at it so I like to get all the gritty stuff out of the way first get all the planning out of the way all the twists and turns um, and then I go back on the third one and, and, and completely layer it and I layer it with uh, one layer of fear a layer of emotion and a layer of description <laughs> so no, that's that, the way I it's plan. really great you say this because I have this discussion all the time with people I write sparse so I write very sparse and then I have to add layers like you do yes I'm yeah. so thrilled you said yeah. that. You know, Steve, it's Stephen King who ruined it for everyone because he yeah. says every time you do another draft, you should take away 10%. Whereas yeah. I have to I add, add 10%. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> Yay. definitely. Oh, I'm yeah. so glad we discussed that. I mean, we're all different, but that just shows you, doesn't it, that sometimes mm. you have to... Mm. And I'm great at description, but I'm not so good at, like, dialogue and, you know, so I always... I love dialogue. I sometimes write whole <laughs> scenes just in dialogue and then go back afterwards on the next draft because I just love the dialogue. Yeah, I do. <laughs> oh, my goodness, that's so funny. You know, maybe we should do a collaboration. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be good, Joanna. That would be fun. Right, we'll park that one. That was... Sh yeah. To behind the scenes um, right I want to come back on a couple of things so um, just on the agents because I split up with my first agent this year and yeah. I made the point when I did that it wasn't a big deal as in a lot of people split up with agents so can you just talk briefly about your agent ex agenting experience and what that means nowadays yeah I guess my, I had my first agent in 2004 and I worked with her for two and a half years and that was on the women's fiction that I was doing and the experience wasn't a very good experience because I was literally, I was on my own really and sometimes I'd be waiting three or four months for her to get back to me um, I worked on the same book for that to whole two and a half years and I was I did, must have done about eight rewrites so when you talk about Stephen King there yeah, it, I just was going over and over and over um, old ground really and then we just got to the stage where she she said, oh yes, we're going to go for a publisher and I thought, oh, this is it, this is finally it and then lo and behold, two months later she'd been working with me to copy edit it she retired 
And she just left me in the air. She, she just emailed me out the blue and just said, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of retiring. Well, I am retiring. Um, I'm only keeping clients on that path for 10 years and, you know, w couldn't even help me to get another agent because she didn't know who to put me with. Um, so I literally didn't write for a year. I completely just thought, well, that's it. There's, there's you know, she's... She's not retired. She is. She just she's, doesn't she's want me. Not good enough. <laughs> yeah. So, and then I, I managed to pick myself up again, and that was probably 2008, and that was when um, I was blogging then and meeting a few people, and I started on Twitter. I think about 2009. So it was just a bit before that, um, and I um, met my, my second agent. I um, and that was with Curtis Brown. She's a lovely agent, Sheila Crowley. Um, and I was with her for three and a half years. And we, like I said, we, you know, the whole saga behind that. We we tried to get some deals, and then it was go away and write another one, see if we can get a deal with that one. Um, and then I don't know. I just felt like um, I felt like I'd become a bit of a burden. I don't think I did, but I did did feel uh, that way. And I just felt with the Kindle market coming out. Um, in the December when I took the book out, I, you know, I, I did it with her blessing, it was it was it was great. And um, by March time, um, I was in the top top of the charts and thinking that I want to bring the estate series out. And I didn't think that she might have been responsible for it, but I didn't feel like I wanted to go for a traditional deal until I tried myself, to be fair. And yes, it could have, you know, I could have fell back on it, but I just wanted to get these three books out and did myself a strategy. Um, and it was a hard decision to make, but it, it was, you know, it was the right decision in the end. Mm -hmm. And December, so December, sorry, not December, 2013, I took out the three estate books and I took them out in every two months in July, I think about October and December. And by the December, when the, the third book was just about to go out, um, I had five agents contact me, which was really, really good. So um, I met with three of them and I had two really, really close ones. And um, and I picked one called Madeline Milburn. And the reason I picked her, although the other one, to be fair, was exactly the same, um, she had the same energy as me. I met her for, for three hours and she just wanted to take me to another level and, and she wanted to get me the boot deal that she thought I deserved, um, if that doesn't sound too big-headed. Mm. But um, she was... Um, she was very, very open to hybrid authors. She was very, very open to what was going on. She was very, very savvy with e-books. And the one particular thing I liked about her was that she'd read every single book, book of mine before she'd come and found me. Mm. And she sent me an email one, one afternoon and said, you know, I've been looking at your website for hours. So when you're talking about websites and having a, a presence there, that's what you need it for. That's how people get to know you. Um, and from there I met her. And, yeah, I signed up with her a week later and, you know, what was it, three months later, three, four months later, she gave me the book deal that I wanted and that was incredible. And she's always there for me, Madeline. She's very much, um, she is my business partner and I'm not quite sure, even, you know, it does sound silly, but I don't think I would have done that a couple of years ago. Now I know I can hold my own and I sp speak to her on a level where she, um, I understand my side of the business and she understands hers and we work really well together doing that. Mm. And that, it's so fantastic to hear that because I think that the role of agents has changed and you've clearly found an agent who's forward thinking. Some yeah. of them are still stuck in the old days, but this is yeah. what people should be looking for is mm -hmm. agents who are business partners. And I would definitely have another agent. You know, it's just you, you, you have to find that right person. So I'm really glad of that. So I, I wanted to just come back on your blog um, and you've talked mm -hmm. about marketing strategy. So and because right now there's a lot of backlash, I feel, against blogging. Everyone's like, well, if you're going to write a thousand words a day, it should be on your fiction or whatever or your book, not on your blog. So what what has your blog done for you? You, um, your high heels and book deals what what does your blog do for you and why do you still love blogging well for me I always started out my platform on a blog I, I blogged before I did high heels and book deals on a, a blog called Al Plate Author oh. and that's how I first started off but it was it was the discipline of writing that I liked about a blog post I always made it about 300 to 400 words I always tried to make it interesting and um 
it, it was a way of go, going around to to find other writers as well at the time. When when be, blogging very first started, we were all into commenting and etc. Because Twitter wasn't around then, mm. um, so I made quite a few friends doing that first. Um, but it was to me when I started high heels and boot deals. I wanted a savvy name. I'm very well known for my high heels, and obviously I couldn't get a boot deal. So high heels and boot deals was absolutely wonderful. But I wanted a niche mm. that would bring a, an audience to me by finding somebody else. Um, that one that was, was basically high heels, which was really, really good. So I used to do an interview called A Chat With and the particular author, give them a list of questions, and at the end it would be, what's your what's your, your poison, high heels or flats? Majority of them were flats, actually. But I had some great shoes on that blog, and everybody would send them. And But the thing with that then, I could, A, I got to know an author, mm. B, I got to know their PR assistant, C, I could then... Uh, put put the blog post out on Twitter, and then it without without me even doing anything. Then it was retweeted by the author, by the PR, by by the publicist. It was absolutely fantastic, and it was two way. When I first started off, I got a lot of um, books to give away, so people were coming back that way. And then I started to do book, book reviewing for the same authors and. So when it came to my time to actually put my book out, I got um, a really valuable network of friends there who, you know, some I've heard people say, oh, you know, you must have done a lot of retweeting and, and you know, well, people, that's what you're saying, you, you buy my book, buy my book, buy my book. No, I didn't. I didn't do any retweeting. They retweeted for me because I'd done the same for them and it was it was great. I didn't ask anybody. I still don't. I still get a bit nervous about it now when I want somebody to retweet something. But... Um, I think through that and actually going to some of the crime writing festivals and then meeting some of these people face to face, that was my free PR. Mm. So when when I wanted to put my book out, they were all there for me, which was really really good. I still do write, write on my blog now. Um, I don't do it as much now because I don't find the time to do it really. To be fair, and um, I'm still at the moment on my blog trying to find a little niche that I want to write about. I'm, I'm thinking at the moment that I'm going to start writing about my own city because if my books are going to go um, into the the US, maybe possibly, then um, we are a little, little known known city in the Midlands. And the potteries are a big thing, so I went right about that. And I thought maybe I could do something that way. Um, so for me, I do like my blogging, and I actually sit down and write. And yeah, I can um, I can mess about a bit sometimes on there, but it, it is. If you look at the posts that I put out, they're quite emotional posts, and that's the way I write. And if people read the blog and then they like that and they buy the book, and that's my job done. Yeah, and I think everything you've said is my secret as well and you know is one you know talk to other people and make relationships you know the podcast the whole point of my podcast of which we're on like 173 I think our episode wow. will be is people I've spent time with like you know yeah. like this and you know this is a connection right when you spend time with people and so that's relationships I still think people don't get it that relationships are still the heart of the internet right I mean, absolutely it's still now networking at the end of the day it's just that you do you, you do it online and then when you go to a, a certain event and you, and you meet all these people you feel like you've known them for years anyway so yeah. it's just one big get kind of have. fantastic <laughs> yeah it is and then and then I also think generosity and social karma are kind of the big things I talk about too by blogging about other people by promoting other people's books for years you yeah. then have earned the right to get attention for your own Absolutely. books yeah. so yeah you, I mean, did did anyone teach you that, or did you just do it naturally? No, I think that was the writer in me. I think mm -hmm. I always wanted to do a bit of writing, you know, every day. I don't probably sit down when people say, "Oh, you should write five hundred words a day or a thousand words a day." Maybe that was my way of blogging. Mm -hmm. um, you know, by, by doing it on, on the blog, I would sit down and, and give myself a bit of discipline to do it that way. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I, I've always enjoyed blogging, but I, I never had a marketing experience. Mm -hmm. I never had marketing experience, um, never in my job or anything like that. And um, I, I kind of get quite annoyed when they say the whole thing behind anybody making success of a book is because they've been marketing savvy. It's not. It's just because, like you say, you give a lot, mm. you get a lot back, mm. and and they're the people that help you eventually to you know to turn that book around. And it's success of the book probably started off because a lot of the people who 
looked at my book, had followed me for years and years and years, and then went and bought the book and actually quite liked it and then reviewed it for me, which was great. So, you know, that was probably where my ball started rolling with the, with the you know, the word of mouth taunting the dead. Mm, absolutely. Right, we are kind of at the end. So tell us a bit more about Watching Over You <laughs> coming out in January 2014. <laughs> Well, I have to say, it's my, my most scariest book, but it's the best thing I've ever had fun writing. <laughs> uh, my best friend is, is really, really worried about my mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, everyone's because... worried about mine too. You know, you're yeah, really <laughs> yeah. Um, watching over you, um, it's basically, um, I've always liked the old films in the 80s, like Single White Female, uh, Fatal Attraction, um, The Hand That Rocked the Cradle, that type of thing. So I wanted to write something, something similar to that. But um, I wanted to choose a different addiction as well because I always do um, quite a lot of um, alcohols and, and drugs and things like that and the books that I write about. Because I'm a gritty writer um, and a very smutty writer, I suppose, I decided to make the main character a sex addict. <laughs> um, and basically, um, Ali um, has had not a very good childhood, um, very, very damaged and... The, I wanted to show um, a relationship between um, a woman falling in love with somebody else and a woman falling apart because of it. So um, one, one part of the book you have Ali, very, very damaged, but all she really wants is a friend. And then you have female Charlie who comes along. They're both in the 30s. Um, Charlie lost her husband a couple of years back, lost a baby as a result of it as well at the time, and wants to move out of the family home and moves into the flat um, that Alla owns, Alla lives above here, and thinks that the friendship that they start to form is okay, and clearly it isn't, and she starts stalking her and following her around, and um, she's damaged, that's all I'm going to say about yeah. that. <laughs> I mean, and I've read a couple of your books, and they are like there's a lot of you know there's some murder murders going on, a lot of violence, and and so just before we finish, I'm really interested because yeah. everyone says the same thing about you know to me. Oh, you seem such a nice person. <laughs> <laughs> look, at, you know, you and me both look at us all nice and smiley, yeah. you know, little cheeky grins. So where do we get this stuff from? <laughs> I have no idea, but what I do think I need to stop doing is apologising every time I talk to somebody yeah. and saying, oh, my book's full of sex, violence and murder. I'm sure Martina Cole never says that she meets any of her fans. But I, I, I don't really know. I think f for me, mainly because I started working on an estate and could see um, how how down and how low people could get and a lot of my books are right are right they they are the characters are very low to start off with um and not in very very good situations but we're hoping by the end of the book that the the hope has come around and and maybe they do have a good ending or maybe they don't um but there's always that emotional feel that you know you want them to do better and you do try and empathize with them with watching over you i really wanted everybody to kind of be really scared of Ali but also really feel really really sorry for it and from the reviews that have come in so far it's been working really well and um, some of the violence scenes do you want I don't know where to write them I have no idea where they come from but um just just put touching on a point here at the moment since Taunting the Dead's gone back out on sale um and been republished with Thomas and Mercer I've had a couple of two-star reviews and they're both from guys so I started, funnily enough, the other day, having a look through some of my uh, reviews to see whether I could you know, guess whether it's a male or female. Now, I've got over 500 review reviews on all the books, and 83% of them are five and four stars, which is great. But some of the two-star ones, that, the ones that always get you, um, they are, majority of them are male. And so they can't understand the actual attraction between the police officer and the main suspect. And they they don't really understand how a professional woman would get that. Well, let me tell you, I've had lots of emails of female cops who actually really understand that sexual attraction. So like you must need something right. So maybe you know maybe women do like crime more, and maybe that's why we write it and we can understand more um, why there's more female authors out there doing it. 
Yeah. We all want justice. To pinch a line from Harrogate Crown Festival, somebody said that we read crown books because we want justice at the end of it, and that to me just completely summed it up. Although you want to throw everything you can at your character, you still want them to come out, you know, happy at the end or, or some sort of fairly Revolution. happy ending. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Fantastic, Mel. So where can people find you and your books online? Um, I'm online at www.malsherrod.co.uk or you can always find me on Amazon. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Mel. That was great. Thank you. You're welcome, Joanna.